Hi, my name is Paul Green from the University of Michigan. I'd like to give you an overview of human factors and ergonomic standards. Uh, for this presentation, I have five goals. First, I want to identify what standards exist for human factors and why they're important. I want to talk about the content of a typical standard, and I also like to describe who develops standards and how it's done. Uh, in the second part of this video, I'll talk about how to find human factor standards and actually demonstrate that on the web. And the third part is I want to talk about key human factor standards. So the intent of this presentation is that when it's done, you have a better sense of how to make use of the standards, how to find them, and have some sense of their content. So why are standards important? And basically, standards exist, at least at the international level, to promote international trade and travel. The best example, as shown on this slide, is that um, after the Second World War, there were a number of efforts developed to foster international trade. And at that time, trade consisted of products that were put on pallets and loaded onto ships and, and moved internationally. The difficulty was that there was a lot of pilferage at the docks, that loading time took a long time because it was individual pallets and so forth. So it was developed, as shown on this slide, is the International Standard Container. Now, the difficult part is the container needed to be interfaced with a wide variety of items. It needed to fit on trucks. It needed to fit on rail cars. It needed to fit on ships. It needed to be handled by cranes. And all of those had to be designed in such a way that they would all be compatible with the container shown here. And if none of those items was compatible with the container, then international shipment would not happen. And as we know, once the container came around, then international trade boomed because it was just much easier to do and safer and more reliable. Uh, second point is international travel is important. People travel over the, all over the world. Here's examples of symbols that you might find in an airport or a train station. And clearly, if you're in a country where you don't speak the language, you'd still need to be able to move around. And having symbols as opposed to words where you don't know the language overcomes that problem. So I want to talk about standards-related documents. And they have a number of names, and they vary us on a variety of dimensions. So first of all, standards can be grouped into two broad categories. One that describes what you should do. So for example, we might have guides or guidelines or information reports or a variety of names that use the word practice. Best practice, code of practice, consensus practice, recommended practice, and the same thing is true for recommendations. In addition, there are documents that exist that say what shall be done or what you must do. And those include a variety of laws, uh, regulations of various types, rules, specifications, and standards. And what I want to emphasize is, although there are these two broad categories, that sometimes something like a guideline, which is in the should case, has in it parts that are regarding as sh what shall one do. And there are other times there are documents like laws that might sometimes just say what you should do. So it's not as if a document in one of these categories is strictly only shoulds or strictly on only shalls, but there tends to be sometimes a little bit of a mixture. So what, in what ways do standard, standards differ, what's in them, and how do we think about them? So the first issue is, what's important is who creates it. Is it a government agency? Is it a standards development organization, commonly referred to as an SDO, or some other organization? And who has input into the process? For trade associations and others, input is only for members of the trade association. For standards development organizations and government organizations, input is from the public. Uh, second is whether what's the breadth of the application. Is it a national standard or within a particular country or an international standard? Is the document available publicly? Is it some sort of trade secret or is it an international standard like an ISO standard or something else put out by a public standards organization. And finally, these documents differ in the kinds that they are. So there's some, st and some, many standards have a mixture of a variety of types in them. 
but typical parts include definitions and reference values. You know, how is this term defined? Um, design. So as shown here, here's an outlet. And there might be a specification for this part, this adapter, and the, the spacing of these pins, the diameter of these pins, etc., will be specified in order for one to be able to plug into an outlet. The plug and the outlet have to be consistent, so therefore the dimensions of those parts have to be well defined. Performance criteria. So here's the case where you can specify not the physical dimensions of an object, but how well it does. So one would argue, gee, this is not a very good case for a performance specification because in order for the collision to be avoided, the heights of the two bumpers need to be the same size and the same height. Um, process examples. So here's a case where you might specify how something is made or verified or checked. Uh, there are other standards that are simply lists of references. Normally these are information reports, but they may be for some other purpose. And finally, within this information report category are standards that really are general summaries of the literature. Uh, last point is, again, the concept of authority. Does this document give shoulds or shalls in it? And also there's the issue of enforcement. I almost forgot that. Enforcement is, are these standards voluntary or required? Now, there are some interesting things where what seems to be voluntary is actually required, and that's the case of some international standards, where countries will say that in order for a product to be imported into a particular country, it must meet all recognized international standards. So although international standards, such as those from the International Standards Organization, ISO, are voluntary because the country requires it for something to be imported, so-called type approval, then in fact was a voluntary standard then becomes a required standard. Um, what I'd like to do is just talk about one standard as an example to give you a sense of what's in them and, how they, and what they actually say. So the example I want to talk about is SAE J2364, a document that I basically wrote, commonly referred to as the 15 second rule. Now this standard is now stabilized so that no further work is happening on it, but you should know what it's about and just what's in it. So all these documents have a title, as shown here, and the title can be rather technical. Um, most standards have something at the beginning as an introduction or a rationale that makes the argument for why the standard is needed. Uh, these vary in terms of how effective the arguments really are. For SAE J2364, here's an example of what the introduction is. Uh, like, is like. So for example, it makes the argument that it takes more time to operate these functions. So that says why one might need such a standard. It provides a citation for, um, its, for that particular information and then talks about further problems associated with this particular um, issue and that's the rationale for this kind of document. And again, sometimes the introduction may just provide an overview and a rationale can be a separate section. But it is important to have a strong argument for why a particular standard is needed. In this case, it's actually a recommended practice. Um, also, there's some information that, that describes the scope. And here's an example of a scope for SAE J2364 to give you some context. So first point is it applies to original equipment, meaning that's what the, manuf the manufacturer who made the product, they have to comply with this but also aftermarket devices. So for example, if we're interested in navigation, we're interested both in navigation systems that are built into the car, but also navigation systems that, are, that users might plug in, or potentially even things that are on their phone. And next point is that the real issue is how the system operates when the vehicle is in motion. Clearly, if the vehicle is parked and you're doing things, there are less safety concerns than if you're actually driving. Um, Another key point is that it only applies to visual information, so auditory information is not covered by this document, and it only complies, requires compliance with manual controls, so speech is not an issue. And there's some other issues as well. So the intent of the scope is to identify the coverage of the document. That is what it covers and what it does not cover. In addition, documents have something in them called normative references.
These are documents that are referred to, and because of the nature in which they're referred to, in some sense they are part of the standard and you must have copies of them. So for J2364 as an example, um, there's a document on hand control reach, field of view, and some others. And here's an example of the text that describes or identifies why these normative references are so important. So for example, the standard says that of interest is controls that are accessible. So what does accessible mean? Well, there's a definition in SAEJ 287, and also they have to be visible under certain circumstances as defined by J1050. So therefore, to implement SAEJ 2364, you also have to have copies of J287 and J1050 to understand the document. And that's not unusual that things, that in order to fully understand one standard, you often need copies of others. And in some cases, it may be that the other standards have normative references, and to understand them, you need other references as well. This is done because if all the information required to understand a standard is in one document and pieces are changed in other standards, then multiple standards need to be changed, and it's very difficult to manage the process. Um, SAE J2364, because it contains a method, actually specifies two of them. And here's the two of them. So the first is called the static method, in which case people do a task and they're timed how long it takes, and whether it exceeds some deadline or not determines on whether or not a task passes or does not pass some requirement. In addition, there's also something called the interrupted vision method. So the subject wears a pair of goggles like this, and they're asked to do some task. The goggles are open for a second and a half and closed for a second and a half. So that simulates the process of looking down and using the device and looking back to the road and looking down to the device and looking back to the road, with the closed period correspond to when you're looking at the road. Um, the details of the procedure are rather extensive, and this is typical, again, of standards. So, for example, it talks about the requirement that the hardware be in the design location. Um, there are 10 subjects, and there are a number of requirements for those 10 subjects, that they, in terms of their familiarity with the interface, that they can operate it, their age, their training, how many practice trials, and so forth. And this is pretty common for a, a good standard, that it has all the details, if there's a process involved, that describe how the testing is carried out because you want the procedure to be replicable. In addition, this standard is somewhat unusual in that it has a performance criterion. Many methods documents just describe how to perform a test, but not what passes or fails. And in the case of the development of this document, there was a great deal of controversy about what should be the acceptance criterion. So in this case, for the static method, the total task time cannot exceed basically 15 seconds. It's a little more complicated than that because you actually take the log of the times and sum them and look if it's less than a log of 15. This was done because some tasks had extremely long times on individual trials and adding them together um, in a strict, simple manner led to things passing when it was just kind of one oddball trial that was one was trying to eliminate. And in addition, if a task takes less than five seconds, it's excluded from the analysis. It just doesn't make any sense. It's just too short. Uh, second is the interruption, interrupted vision method. And in this method, we're looking at the times, the shutter open times, and um, adding them up, and then looking if they're less than 20 seconds. But again, it's a log procedure, not strictly additive. Again, to get rid of these, the undesired effects of um, extremely long tr and rare trials. Uh, the next topic I'd like to cover is who develops standards in that, and the process involved. The process is fairly consistent across many organizations. Uh, in the United States government, they all follow the Administrative Procedures Act, and basically a large number of organizations are involved that need to comply with this process. And here's just a quick list. Um, so, for example, the Consumer Product Safety Commission is responsible for toys and jet skis and off-road vehicles. The Department of Labor is responsible for, has issues related to machine guarding that apply to, where there are human factors issues. 
The FAA, there are issues of passenger evacuation, all kinds of aircraft issues. Uh, the Federal Motor Carrier Safety Administration is worried about hours of service. NHTSA, the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration, is concerned with driver distraction. The Food and Drug Administration is concerned with various kinds of medical devices, drug labels, and so forth. And the NRC is obviously concerned with operation of nuclear power plants. So they, they are also covered by this particular act. All of them have standards, guidelines, and various other kinds of documents, and they are developed following this particular method. So here's how it works. I'm not a lawyer, uh, so I'm not perfect in my description of it, but I think I can capture the gist of how it works. And I should comment that other organizations, like standards development organizations, follow the same basic idea of making the process public and allowing for all parties to provide input. So the first thing that might happen is some agency within the government will say, we need to have a standard on some particular issue. Uh, that may be the agency decides it's necessary, or Congress uh, passes a bill asking the agency to act on some particular problem. Uh, the next thing that happens is that a document called a Notice of Propose, Proposed Rulemaking appears in the Federal Register. The Federal Register is a document which comes out daily, which has print in it the size of an old-style telephone book and often hundreds of pages. And it describes all the activities of the government for one day. So that notice appears in the Federal Register. Looks like this. Uh, then organizations are asked to provide comments on what the proposed rule or requirement is. That can be companies. It can be individual citizens who are interested in some topic and get wind of it. It can be trade associations. It could be unions. It could be any one or number of individuals or groups. There's no constraints on who's allowed to comment. Um, the next thing that happens is the government, after the comment period has ended, then takes all of those comments and tries to provide a summary of how people responded. And surprisingly, if an, even if an individual comments, that person's name and sort of the gist of their comment and the government response to it can appear in the Federal Register. Uh, next thing that happens, sometimes before this, sometimes overlapping with it, is a public hearing on whatever the particular issue is. Uh, typically, that's held, held in Washington, D.C. because of that's where the, the capital is, but it's not unusual if it's a major question for, them to, for there to be satellite hearings uh, spread out across the nation. So there might be, for example, a hearing in uh, San Francisco and one in Chicago, or if it's automotive related, it might be in Detroit because that's where so many people related to automotive are. Um, they try to make it in multiple locations and at least to give people, the public an opportunity to comment. That's very important in this process. Uh, then based on comments, the proposed rule is modified. There'll be some feed, additional feedback provided uh, based on the public input. And eventually, if indeed they, there's solid justification for it, that particular rule is again published in the Federal Register and it becomes the law of the land. Uh, it's not unusual in this litigious environment for there to be legal action contesting one part of proposed rules or another. And so it may take some time before the final regulation settles out. Uh, and as my point here is that it can sometimes take years to deal with that input and to get agreement as to how this process occurs. Other countries will have somewhat different processes, but the same basic themes are consistent across uh, democratic governments that they put something out in the, to the public. There's opportunities for comment. Those comments are considered. There's often specific replies to each comment. It doesn't mean the government's going to email you back, but there will be some public display of, of the kinds of comments that were made and how people responded to them. The regulations will be modified. Uh, consistent with some of the comments. It doesn't mean that they always will be, but there's some, some serious effort to consider public input, and then the item is, is published. And again, it's not unusual to have legal actions because some party's not happy with the final decision. Uh, uh, standards development organizations, other than governments, uh, basically follow the same process. Uh, 
Again, the, the key is to have, in this case, recognized technical experts. It's important that those experts have no conflicts of interest. And it's not a majority rules. It's an attempt to build consensus. And so therefore, it's important. This, this, the, the need to build consensus takes time because you really want to get the parties to agree. Now, it doesn't mean that everybody agrees to everything. But if an attempt is made within a standards development organization to get something to pass, and only 51% of it are in favor, it probably will not move forward. It's going to take a real consensus, a real belief among a number of the experts that something should be done. Um, this process is followed by professional organizations, such as the Society of Automotive Engineers, the American Society for Mechanical Engineers, IEEE, and so forth. And they develop standards and other kinds of guidance documents. If an individual wants those standards, they need to pay for them because it's payment for standards and other sources of revenue that allows these organizations to have standards development efforts. Um, most cases, that means publishing the documents, editing the documents, having a staff who goes to the various meetings and takes notes, who circulates the documents. It's, a not, it's not a trivial process in terms of expense. Uh, those organizations, either directly or indirectly, will report often to national standards organizations. So for example, in the United States, that's the American National Standards Institute. In the UK, that's the British Standards Institute. In Germany, there's an organization, and so forth. And those organizations, likewise, support standards development efforts. Their efforts are funded by, typically, the sale of standards. These organizations can then report, either directly or indirectly, to international standards organizations, such as ISO, the International Standards Organization, the International Tele Telecommunications Union, the International Electrotechnical Commission, and others. Again, these organizations sell standards as well. And so sometimes it's technical organization to ISO. Sometimes it's direct. Sometimes they're not. these two organizations aren't involved. It's just the national organizations are sending representatives. But the actual standard happens at the ISO level. It varies very much with the standard. Um, the ISO is the largest organization in international standards effort. To give you a sense of their scope, the last time I looked, they had 312 technical committees, and that number continues to grow. Uh, here's some examples of some of the committees that exist to give you a sense of their scope. So one of the first ones formed was one for information technology. This is a joint technical committee. Um, technical committee eight has to do with ships, steel, aircraft, 22 is road vehicles. That's one that I'll talk about later, food products, Rubber and rubber products, plastics, uh, of, uh, of interest to us is TC159 ergonomics. And the last one that I noted down is TC312, excellence and service. So the committees have gone over time from kind of fundamental uh, technologies and fundamental products more and more towards specialization as committees grow over time in terms of their number. Uh, the organization of a committee is as follows. First of all, every committee has a secretariat. Uh, the secretariat is the company, the, the country or the organization that manages it. So it could be the United States is responsible for something, or it could be the, the uh, Society of Automotive Engineers. The committee is led by a convener, that's the chair, the technical leader, and most committees have multiple subcommittees. So as an example, uh, technical Committee 22 is, as I mentioned earlier, that's road vehicles. The country that's responsible for it is AFNOR, which is the French standards organization. That, one ha that Technical Committee 22 has 11 subcommittees and five working groups, and they're liaisons with other organizations and other committees because there are activities which, for example, vehicle technology, which is also the concern of TC204, so they need to know what the ergonomics people are doing but the ergonomics people need to know what the technical, the vehicle developers are doing. So there needs to be a liaison between the two of them. Here's some examples of some of the committees that are within Technical Committee 22. Data communication, vehicle dynamics, lighting, safety, motorcycles are a special group. And obviously of interest to us is ergonomics. 
Subcommittee 39. And then finally, there's also a special committee for commercial vehicles, buses, trailers. And it's not unusual to have uh, cars and light trucks being one group and sort of smaller personal vehicles be another and heavy vehicles be a third subcommittee. You see that a, a great deal. So the uh, next thing to mention are the working groups associated with subcommittee 39. Here's its official de designation, TC22 SC39. And here's part of the list. So there are four working groups, control symbols and telltales, that's their, that's the technical, their technical name for warning lights, symbols, reach, and transport information and control systems on board MMI, man machine interface. Yes, there's lots of jargon. Notice the committee numbers are not numbered sequentially. Uh, that's because has, way back when other committees existed and they were dropped. In addition, um, these, this, this subcommittee meets typically about twice a year. Meetings are, are on the order of a week long and where they meet varies. Often they meet in Europe. Sometimes they meet in the United States and rarely they will meet in uh, Asia, sometimes in Japan, rarely in Australia. Uh, the main reason is because many of the members are from Europe. They want to minimize the average uh, amount of airfare that people have to worry about. So unfortunately, the people in Asia often end up with bigger airfare bills than the Europeans or the Americans. Uh, one of the challenges is that people look at these activities and they kind of think of it as a boondoggle because, oh, we're going to send this engineer to Paris for a week. And the feeling is this is going to be just playtime. And quite frankly, the answer is no. They're going to be in meetings pretty much all day. They may go out to dinner and have advantage of that, but they're, they're not going to play tourist. The convener for Subcommittee 39 is John Shutko at Ford. The secretariat, the organization that is responsible for keeping track of the paperwork, for handling notes and meetings and so forth, is the Society of Automotive Engineers. They report their activities to ANSI, which is the American National Standards Organization. Now for um, the United States and and to belong or to Subcommittee 39 and to, to run it and to belong to ISO, the United States, actually ANSI, I believe, pays dues to the International Standards Organization. So not only do these organizations um, need the sale of documents to survive, but they also need fees, membership fees, from those who are participating in activities of ISO. I may have more to say about that later. So um, the one that's of greatest interest to us is Sub Technical Committee 22, Road Vehicles, Subcommittee 39, Ergonomics, Working Group 8, which has to do with uh, in technology inside vehicles. Here's a list of some of the standards that they have developed over time. And I just want to mention these to give you a sense of what they have done. So for example, there's a, st a standard associated with symbols, ISO 2575, that's updated every year. Every year there's a new amendment for some new standards that have been added. Um, ISO 3409 has to do with foot control spacing. 3958, reach. And there's an SAE standard that's related to it. Um, ISO 4040, where controls are located. Um, 12204, time critical warnings. Uh, 1224, this one's been, 214, that's been around for a while. Direction of motion of stereotypes. If a person moves a control, how is the associated display expected to move? Uh, one on auditory information, and then one on visual presentation of information. And again, this is about half of them that are out there. I'm just trying to give you a sense of what exists. So let me talk about the ISO process, which in many ways mirrors the federal process, but is different and you need to know some of the names of the groups and so forth are involved should you ever decide to get involved in ISO activities. And so the process is something like this. Uh, at, in an ISO unit, for example, Technical Committee 22, Subcommittee 39, one of the countries that has a national delegation requests some standard on some topic. Uh, so for example, let's imagine that the automation work uh, 
that's now becoming important was handled by Subcommittee 39. Then a delegation, say, from Sweden would say, well, we think there's a need for a standard on this topic, and here's some ideas about it. And that's usually discussed informally within the technical committees or subcommittees usually for, for some period of time. And eventually, it becomes what's called a new work item, meaning it's now formally on their agenda. This is important because the time period from when a new work item is proposed and a standard must be published is three years. And if something does not appear in that three-year period after work starts, then it's discarded. So there's real pressure to spend some time to build a consensus as to what's needed and to kind of do the groundwork before it becomes an official work item. And so this is usually discussed, as noted, at the working group level. So the subcommittee has working groups, and it's the working groups within the subcommittees where the real discussion happens and the details are worked out. Now, here's the actual specifics of the process shown in this uh, figure. So the working group decides there should be a standard for some topic, or at least to consider it. That item is then identified to be associated with a task force, which is a subcommittee or a subgroup of the task of the working group. And typically the working group might be 10 people or 15 people. The task force might be three, four, five. It's just easier to get things done in a small group with the most interested parties. And there's a lot of back and forth between the working group and the task force until there's real agreement as to what it should be. And I should comment that typically the task force members are a subgroup of the working group. There's not too many people who are on the task force who are not in the working group. And the working group is representative, are representatives, people from a variety of countries. Um, most of those who are the major car producing countries, the United States, UK, uh, Sweden, Netherlands, uh, China, uh, sometimes Korea, uh, Japan, and so forth. Now what happens is once they have agreement as to what the working group is going, what the standard is going to be at the working group level, then it's passed up to the subcommittee. Often a few members of the working group are members of the subcommittee, if not many of them, but the subcommittee consists of people, from a larger group from a larger number of countries. And then they'll debate the item, and if they they can say, I, we, we agree with it, in which case it becomes a committee draft that's passed along to the technical committee the next level up. Or they can be unhappy with what's developed, have questions, comments, and it gets passed back to the working group. I should comment that as the working group is doing their tasks, they're giving reports to the subcommittee, so the subcommittee has a heads up as to what's going to happen. So it goes to a committee draft, subcommittee has to vote, working group votes are by individual, subcommittee votes start to become votes by country. Technical committee votes are always votes by country. So at, when you're at the technical committee level, it's very much like the UN, um, where each country has only one vote. Then if the technical committee approves, it becomes a draft international standards, and then a future draft, a future draft international standard. It's passed along to ISO headquarters in Geneva, they do editing, they make sure the translation into French, if it was developed in English, is appropriate. There's always some editing. It then goes along to the main ISO unit and it's published. And again, this process takes several years to accomplish. But the goal is to, to develop a document for which there's consensus support that's based on solid evidence that countries all over the world will adopt. That takes time. Um, Comments about the delegates, because I think this is important. Um, the ex the num each country has uh, sometimes not too many constraints in the number of delegates can send to a working group. Um, clearly, you don't want too many because it's just not effective. And the problem is funding these individuals. So for example, typically these are individuals who either represent their governments or represent companies because companies see that there's an important interest in developing an international standard, and they want to make sure that their pro processes, their products, and their services are compliant. Uh, it's usually the case that they have some expertise of the topic, but the amount of expertise varies. Uh, people who do serve on these committees invariably have to make a long-term commitment. And my experience has been 
that if you come in and think you're going to be on a committee for just a year and leave, you're not going to be very effective. That it's usually after two or three or four years, certainly a minimum of two, that you're becoming to be effective. And most of the people that serve on these committees are there for five years or longer. The meetings are generally held in English, although at the technical committee level, there's a responsibility to also communicate in French uh, and to follow a lot of procedures that kind of mimic what happens at the UN, especially at the higher levels where it's not peer-to-peer -peer, but trying to represent what countries are involved. The decisions are kind of a mixture of technical decisions and political decisions. Uh, that's unfortunate, but that's kind of the nature of it. Um, and obviously, I mentioned voting earlier, and depending on the level, whether it's an individual who votes or a country who votes, and therefore the delegation needs to come up with an agreement as to who votes on what is important. In addition, when there are votes, there are always comments. And again, because this is a consensus process, uh, even if something passes, it's really important for the people who are shepherding the document through to look at the comments and see if changes can be made to accommodate those that have negative views. Uh, again, this is a consensus process, not a majority rules. All right. Following uh, this is some additional information on how to find standards. So for those of you that wish to take a break, you can stop the video now. Otherwise, we can continue on.